In this edition, we've got some fantastic layouts to share with you, including some that have been in operation for decades. As for prototypes, we'll take you to some absolutely amazing railroad destinations and explore great equipment from the past and present. And of course, we all strive to add realism and detail to our layouts. So we'll share some secrets and techniques that will help you make your operation look more authentic. And when you see this graphic, pay attention because it tells you the name of a computer file stored on this DVD, including additional details and techniques for creating and improving your layout. Let's get rolling as we bring the action, power, and creativity of model railroading to life in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. One of the biggest decisions a model railroader has to make before laying down the first piece of track is what industry will the layout feature. Most people settle on one or two areas of interest, but not Ed Loazzo. His 20 by 30 foot S gauge train room hosts five industries. There's the dairy section, the coal mining corner, the foggy hollow logging camp, a petroleum operation, and a steel mill. All of these industries rely on trains to either receive their raw materials or to ship their products out to consumers. And all of them are situated near the Hudson River, running from the Palisade Cliffs just outside of New York City through rural towns in upstate to Albany. The mighty Hudson serves as a link between the five industries on this ambitious layout. The layout is based on the Catskill Mountains mainly because I lived in that area as a child. I grew up in the area. I think it's a beautiful part of the country. It's very picturesque and it's a perfect setting for a model railroad layout. The corners of the room were kind of a tough challenge. Uh, we have these broad radius curves for the main line which leaves little triangular places in the corners and I fill those areas in with uh, industries such as a coal mine and a logging uh, area and an oil refinery and so forth to provide switching opportunities for the trains. Like many men who have made model railroading their hobby, Ed can trace his interest back to memorable times he spent with his dad. There are two areas in the layout that pay special tribute to Ed's father and the first one is here in the petroleum industry section. The senior Loazzo worked for Mobile for almost 40 years. So Ed added these details in his honor. Although it's not seen, New York City is just around the bend of the Hudson. And if you follow the backdrop a bit further in this direction, the plumes of smoke lead you to the next industry, steel. This bustling area has warehouses, factories, a flour mill, and another mobile station. It's adjacent to the old part of town whose seedier side includes a tattoo parlor and a boarding house. Just up the road from the steel mill, an unfortunate driver has had a run-in with a guardrail and a tow truck waits in the wings. Nearby, a passenger station in town connects to the main line where we follow it to Peekskill, a small upstate New York town. Following the track leads to a waterfall area where trains go over a large silver bridge made out of over 6,500 pieces of plastic. Ed is particularly proud of the water scenes on his layout. There are hikers at the base of the waterfall and deer graze in the park. The lake was made of masonite and covered with many layers of wax to create a wet looking surface. Many friends and craftspeople help Ed create individual components of the layout. But Ed built this stone arch viaduct himself. The other industries in this layout include one of New York State's dairy concerns, where a cooling tower, ice house, and cold power boiler all add to the scene's authenticity. There are several kinds of bulk milk cars, which are insulated glass lined containers designed to keep the milk fresh and cold. As we move up the tracks from the dairy, we come to the foggy hollow logging camp, where two spar poles load logs onto steam powered railroad cars. Well, the lumbering operation is quite unique since I've modeled the entire process from cutting the trees down 
to the shipping of uh, finished cut lumber to a customer. Uh, the process includes uh, traveling on the railroad trains down to the sawmill, dumping the logs into a pond, uh, lifting them onto a, a sawmill conveyor, cutting them up, uh, pushing them up a narrow gauge uh, railroad to the loading and storage area, and then uh, loading it onto a freight train for delivery to the big city. So we've covered the entire process from the cutting of the tree to the finishing of the cut lumber. Ed has quite a collection of cars that reflect his appreciation of both history and the trains that helped create that history. There are a number of World War II military trains that include an unusual hospital car with doctors and nurses and an ambulance car. And as a nod of appreciation to railroad workers, Ed has a steam-powered work train that features living quarters. A true model railroad layout is never finished. My uh, future plans include finishing up the electronics uh, wiring so that I can use DCC to control the locomotives. I have some staging yards uh, under construction at the moment, which will be in a different room, an adjacent room, and uh, trains can enter onto the layout proper through uh, a hole in the wall and uh, circle the layout and exit back out to the staging yards. Uh, so formal op sessions will follow that where uh, my friends will come over and we will spend many an afternoon uh, running the trains uh, according to timetables and schedules and with uh, true professional uh, management skills being used to keep the trains on time and on schedule. One of the most frustrating things that can befall your model railroad during an operating session is to have short circuit trouble. I get reader letters all the time from our magazine that say, my DCC system has a problem. It works well one minute and it stops the next. What can I do? Well, here are five steps for finding shorts on your model railroad and how to prevent them. The first step is to identify that there really is a short on your model railroad. Uh, can you show me out of Waterbury at 2.04 p.m., please, David? 2.04, you got it. All right, thank you. Hey, wait a minute here, David. I've just lost power. What do you think the problem might be? Well, let's see if it's a short. All right. While DCC systems all have circuit breakers built into them, typically these don't provide much diagnostic value when it comes to troubleshooting. It's a good idea to add circuit breakers to your layout that can tell you there is a short circuit. Most all DCC circuit breakers have LEDs that indicate that they are functioning properly and when a short circuit is present. If you don't have one or more of these on your layout and you have a lot of problems with shorts, you should divide your layout into power districts and install a circuit breaker on each district. This can help you isolate short circuits to particular parts of your layout and make troubleshooting them a lot easier. If all else fails, check that your track has power. The train may have stopped for reasons other than a short. DCC Specialties makes the Railroad Amp Meter, which is specifically designed for use with DCC systems. Use the meter to check the track. If you get a reading, there's no short circuit, so it must be something else. Well, it doesn't look like a short, so give it a push. It might be dirty wheels. All right. Yep, yeah, that's that, it. That looks like that was a problem. Thanks, David. Step two, check your track and turnouts. Oops, it looks like we've got a problem here. One of the first things you should check in this situation is if you've got a turnout problem. First, check to see if the locomotive or car with electrical pickups has run through a turnout set against it. This is a common cause for tripping a circuit breaker. Look for a car or a locomotive with metal wheel sets that may have derailed across a turnout. This will also cause a short circuit. If a particular turnout seems to be a repeat offender for short circuits, check its rail alignment with a track gauge. If the track checks out, next check the gauge of the wheel sets or a car or locomotive that seems to cause the short. All it takes is one metal wheel to bridge the gap between two rails of opposite polarities for a split second and it'll trip the circuit breaker. Correct the car, locomotive, or turnout before putting them back into service. Oh, I see. It looks like it just overran the switch. Thanks, David. Yeah. Step three, check your DCC system. Whoa, David, it looks like the layout's lost power. Yeah, let's check it out. All right. It may seem obvious, but a lot of times people will overlook the fact that the problem may be that the DCC system is shut down. 
If you're running a lot of trains or had your system on a long time, the system's booster may have overheated and switched itself off. I had that happen to me once during one of my operating sessions. If the booster is overheated, you're probably running too many trains at the same time for it to handle the current draw. Once the booster is cooled and reset itself, you can test your layout's current draw by connecting the railroad amp meter between the railroad and your booster and then run some trains. The draw current will be measured in amps. If you're drawing too much current, you'll need to consider running fewer trains or dividing your layout into power districts and adding one or more additional boosters to correct the problem. If the system is turned off and won't reset itself after about five minutes, it never hurts to check the power supply. The fuse may have blown, or the DCC system could simply have come unplugged. Oh, I got it. It looks like somebody kicked out the plug. Okay, David, thanks. It looks like we're going now. Step four, look for metal objects that may be on the rails. Whoa, David, looks like you had another problem here. Well, let's see if there's anything laying on the tracks. All right. Any metal object that bridges two rails will cause a short. Walk the layout and look for a tool that may have been set on the track. Also, look for metal detail parts that may have come off a piece of equipment, such as a wire used for a brake pipe. These small details can wedge themselves between rails and cause shorts. Sometimes only when a car or a locomotive rolls over the top of them and applies just enough pressure to complete the circuit. Don't allow your operators to set any objects on the layout. A pop can, paper clip, or a pen with a metal cap will cause a short just as easily as anything else left on the rails. Well, I didn't see anything. I didn't either. Oh, hey, wait a second, my, my soda here. Huh? Yeah, that looks like it was it. Step five, if all else fails, check your electrical connections. Screw terminals are some of the biggest offenders. If the screw gets loose and the wire hangs a little bit off, it'll cause a short circuit, usually intermittently. I once spent an entire week looking for a short circuit in a large control panel I'd built simply because of a loose screw terminal. Also check any solder connections between track feeders and your track bus. A solder joint may have come loose, causing a loss of power. Or, if wires of opposite polarity are running close together, a loose wire may be touching the bus of the opposite polarity, causing a short. Electrical connections also extend to where track feeders are soldered to the rails. However, if you're having trouble because of a track feeder, most often it will affect only one piece of the railroad and not all of it. If all else fails, disconnect all the track buses from your DCC system and then reconnect them one at a time. When you find the one that's causing the short circuit, you'll need to do a thorough examination of the wiring and track work on that section of the layout. While short circuits can be a big headache, they're also fairly easy to fix if you know what you're looking for. If you work carefully and methodically, you can actually prevent short circuits from occurring and therefore spend more time enjoying running your trains. When they began carving Mount Rushmore back in the 1920s, the tourism business here in South Dakota started to take shape as well. Just a few minutes from this giant monument, you'll find the old-time city of Hill City, home to about 700 friendly people and a million memories. Hill City was born back in the 1870s in the heart of the Black Hills, when the lure of gold was so strong that many miners said goodbye to their hometowns and came here looking for good fortune. Well, Hill City is the second oldest town in the Black Hills. Um, we have the oldest hand-hewn log building left in the state of South Dakota, which is now uh, the city mercantile. Uh, the Alpine Inn restaurant, uh, which used to be the Harney Peak Hotel, which was built by the Harney Mining Company back in the 1800s, is a nice historical building there. Uh, we also have the um, uh, Museum of Geological Research, where they uh, reconstruct dinosaur fossils recovered from the area. One of the biggest attractions in Hill City is the historic Black Hills Central Railroad, the 1880 train as the locals refer to it. The historic mountain train will give you a two-hour, 20-mile round trip into the past. You'll experience the same kind of ride that the miners and prospectors of 100 years ago did. And a lot of work goes into bringing you these memories. 
Let's take a look at the vintage train cars pulled by the old time steam locomotives. A close look at the restoration process shows you that bringing one of these babies back to life doesn't involve just carpentry, but ornate quality cabinet work as well. So far in the car project, we have found Douglas fir, southern yellow pine, yellow poplar, oak, ash, and Honduran mahogany, which uh, surprised us. Uh, we've had to do a lot more to really restore it than we had planned on, but uh, from our initial investigation of it, but it is going to be as close to as built originally as possible. Now let's take a look at one of the engines. Locomotive number seven, built in 1919, and at present a semi-retired star of stage and screen. Locomotive number seven was originally built for the Prescott and Northwestern Railway in Prescott, Arkansas. It came here in the late 50s or early 60s. It's a 262 uh, locomotive that was built by Baldwin. Uh, it has a tender on it. It is a wet steam engine. It operates under 200 pounds pressure. And it has 200 two-inch boiler tubes. It takes about 300 gallons of fuel and 2,500 gallons of water for the trip from here to Keystone and back, which is about 18 and a half to 20 miles. It has been in the movie Scandalous John that was done by Walt Disney. It was in the uh, Gunsmoke Snow Train series with James Arness a number of years ago. It was in the movie Orphan Train that was pretty much filmed in its entirety here. The passenger cars that we have came from uh, various areas around the country and uh, were built in the 1880s and 1890s. We have two Pullman coaches that were used in Nebraska as passenger cars, uh, built in 1888 and 1889. Uh, we also have some cars that were used in British Columbia and Oregon as part of their transit system, and those were uh, built in the 1890s. The run uh, takes place on a 10-mile spur of the old uh, Black Hills High Line, which was built back in the 1890s. The spur was put in place from Hill City to Keystone to support the mining industry that was growing at that time. And uh, it goes up through the mountains behind Mount Rushmore. Uh, it's a very scenic ride. You get to see a lot of old mining artifacts, old gold camps, things of that nature. You'll just keep on marveling at the scenery as this train climbs up Harney Peak, which at an elevation of 7,200 feet makes it the highest point in the Black Hills and the highest point east of the Rocky Mountains until the Swiss Alps. So if you're in the neighborhood, climb aboard the Black Hills Central Railroad. And don't forget the camera. And remember, there's even more to see just minutes away. The Crazy Horse Memorial is just 10 minutes from Hill City, and Mount Rushmore just 15 minutes away. The heart of the Black Hills, inviting, hospitable, inspiring. In the small city of Zanesville, Ohio, stands a very large landmark. A Y-shaped bridge spans the junction of two rivers. It's said to be the only bridge of its type in the world. Just beyond the river stands another local landmark, a site marked only by the small initials on the door. Inside, the Zane Trace and National Trail Model Railroad Club has built a freelance railroad inspired by the city, the industries, and the rolling hills of southern Ohio. CNO 1633, you have permission to leave Jackson Siding. The club's 25 members have deep roots in the area and applied their knowledge of its history and landscape to the design of the railroad. Greg Short, who works full-time as a local fireman, has been a member of the Zanesville Club for 25 years. 
I had a great uncle who was a member of another club, uh, got me involved in model rare riding. My dad helped me get started with a four by eight layout. And then over time, I came to join here and became, you know, involved with helping build this layout and other things. Zanesville is located 50 miles east of Columbus, Ohio. The club takes its name from an early frontier path through the Ohio Valley built by pioneer Ebenezer Zane. A segment of the trail became part of the National Road, a major route for settlers heading west in the 1800s. 1633, permission to go into Nitro. While much is known about the namesake of the club, its own early days remain a mystery. It was formed sometime around 1950, but no one knows where. They've been here at this site for the past 30 years. The club's been here since the late 70s, and we're presently working on our third layout in the building. The layout is designed as a series of loops, but operates as a point-to-point -point railroad covering 12 scale miles between Zanesville and Charleston, West Virginia. Nearby cities are also represented, including Vienna, where a major bridge crosses the Ohio River. South of Vienna, the scenic hills become the rugged terrain of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, high points of this layout definitely is the scenery. Uh, we've used several techniques. Uh, we have a member who uh, has access to cardboard, so we have a lot of cardboard-based shell with hydrocow over it. Uh, we also use a lot of uh, foam board that we have stacked, carved, and then covered either in plaster and painted it and, or used just uh, ground foam, things like that, to cover it. The railroad is dominated by large industries, including a stamping company, and the National Republic Steel Plant, which serves as the railroad's largest customer. Many of the structures were built to represent area landmarks. Uh, the structures were either straight out of the box, built that way, or kit bashed. Uh, the rolling stock, for the most part, all belongs to individual club members. The club itself owns about 25 to 30 cars, and we do things like weather them, put metal wheels on them, Katie couplers, uh, pretty much the basics that you would do on any model railroad. The club started work on this current layout back in 1992, but the project was nearly derailed by a steep and very long stairway. Some of the biggest challenges we faced have been you know, the building itself, being on the third floor, being able to move everything up here to accomplish what we've done. The club's location on a top floor of a building with no air conditioning and no elevator made the demolition and rebuild a major challenge, but one that in the end was well worth the effort. Went from being able to operate two trains in one yard to having three operational main yards. We can operate four mainline cabs now, as well as we have approximately five industries that all have their own power and can be operated during a run session. Club members decided on a maximum grade of 2.3% to make it challenging but still allow for long trains. The design also called for most of the track to be built near eye level to give a more realistic viewing experience. Numerous small details add to that effect. We have a couple areas on here where we have little animated scenes. We have a bulldozer that's operational and we have what looks to be a, a, a man welding on a pipeline in an air, another area. And we have a lot of the buildings on the layout lighted. I would do it, give it a more realistic effect to the layout, make you actually think you're in a real scene. While the club is happy with the current layout, major improvements continue. Uh, right now our biggest challenges are we're going through and signaling the whole layout, as well as installing switch machines on all the mainline switches, which are already installed. So adding, you know, we have to come in from underneath to install these things. And it just, it makes it a challenge. After 30 years of stair climbing their way through three different layouts, members of the Zane Trace and National Trail Model Railroad Club are ready to take on any challenges and continue to be inspired by what they know best, the landmarks, the history, and the beauty of Southern Ohio. Many of today's wood structures feature walls with milled siding patterns. Though the walls are rigid with the grain, they're somewhat flexible across the grain. Therefore, you'll want to brace your wood structure kits. It's also important to brace wood structure kits because wood is porous and therefore it'll expand and contract with changes in humidity. 
Here's a structure I've already started to apply the bracing to. As you can see, I've braced the corners, I've braced along the bottom edge, the top edge, and also in the middle portions of the wall. Now it's important before you start applying the bracing that you read the kit's instructions as each kit uh, goes together a little differently. This one has a base and then a subfloor which creates a little notch that the wall panels seat against to help keep the walls at right angles. So you want to be sure that you're not cutting the strip wood from the top all the way to the bottom of the wall. Otherwise the bracing is going to cause the wall to seat crooked. Another thing you want to check for on your kit is the windows. You want to be sure that when you brace a structure that your bracing isn't interfering with how the windows fit into their openings. This particular structure uses a peel and stick cardstock window that has a frame that you just press to the outside of the wall panel and then the window which presses in from the inside. Some kits will use injection molded plastic windows which need to be pushed in from the outside of the wall and you want to make sure you have sufficient clearance so that the window slides into its opening properly and will fit in there without looking goofy. Now I'm going to go ahead and add bracing to the final wall panel. Since I already have the bracing for the corners, all I have to do is add the bracing along the top and the bottom wall panels. For this project, I'm going to use eighth inch by eighth inch strip wood. And I'm going to use a razor saw and a miter box to cut the bracing. So I've already gone ahead and measured the distance between the uh, corner bracing here, which is one and 13 sixteenths of an inch. And the nice thing with the miter box here is that this one has little notches in it. So you can just seat the wood right in there, line it up with the mark. And like that, it's cut. Looks like the strip was a little tight, so I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, use my sanding stick here and just remove a little bit of the wood until it fits in the opening properly. All right, let's see how this works. That looks better. All right, so I'll go ahead and cut one more piece for the bottom, and then we'll go ahead and start gluing the wall sections together. You have a couple different options when gluing the bracing to the wall panels. You can use a CA glue or super glue. The advantage of this is that it dries quick, though once the wood's bonded, you're going to have a tough time pulling it apart, so you don't have a lot of wiggle room. You have to get it right on the first try, otherwise you're going to have to real carefully try to remove the strip wood. Or you can use a wood glue. A wood glue is nice because it has a little bit slower drying time. You have about 15 to 20 minutes to position the wood, the strip wood the way you want it. You want to stay away from glues with high water content such as white glue as these can warp the walls. So I'm going to go ahead and apply the bracing to the final wall on this wood structure kit. I'm going to use CA in this case since it dries quicker. I'm going to go ahead and apply the strip wood. I have a little, little bit of CA on a piece of styrene here and a micro brush applicator. Just go ahead and apply the CA. It's also a good idea to keep a little debonder on hand in case you uh, get your fingers stuck or you get your fingers stuck to the piece of strip it with the, the CA on it. And I'm going to go ahead and apply the strip wood here. I've already marked out where the corner bracing is on here in pencil, so I know that I'm not going to apply the strip wood incorrectly. And then you just press it down. And then repeat the process for the bottom. Now on the bottom bracing here, I've also marked the line where the subfloor is so I don't put my bracing too low. 
And here are the two pieces of horizontal bracing. So now I'll go ahead and measure the vertical braces, which I'll put two of on the wall sections here. And again, I'll use the miter box to make the cuts and use the CA to go ahead and uh, attach the strip wood to the wall panels. And here we see the two vertical braces that have been installed. I just kind of space them out intermittently from the corners just to provide a little extra bracing across the uh, walls. And you've noticed here that I've left uh, adequate room for the window to fit in properly. And this brace here won't interfere with anything, so it's fine where it's at. So I'm going to go ahead and attach the wall to the building. And in this instance here, I'm going to go ahead and apply the CA to the existing corner bracing here. Just go ahead, press it in, and just hold it for a couple seconds as the CA sets, and you'll be in business. The other area I'm going to brace on this structure is this area by the peak of the roof. Now I could use the strip wood, but instead I'm going to take a piece from the carrier sheet that the walls were cut from. This little piece of wood here has a nice triangular shape that I'm going to cut with the uh, chopper here. The chopper is a handy tool to have when working with wood structure kits. It comes with these handy miter guides for cutting at 30, 45, 60, and 90 degree angles. Today I'm going to use the chopper to cut this little piece of bracing from the strip or from the carrier sheet that's going to go right up in here. As you can see this piece is a little too big for the chopper so I'm just going to go ahead and break away the excess material. And then just go ahead and push down the lever. There's a little single edge razor blade in there. Got your cut. And you want to measure, just put some little tick marks on the wood or line it up on the grid on the uh, self healing mat when you make your cut. I'm just going to check the piece to make sure it'll fit in there. And it will. Want to make sure I stay clear of the tabs that the roof panels will rest on. ahead and put a little bit of CA on and I'm going to use a pair of tweezers to handle this piece since it's kind of small. And I'll just go ahead whoop, that looks about right and we'll just press it into place. There you can see how it fits in and just adds a little extra support to that wall panel, particularly up on the top here. Now one last thing before I install the roof panels that I like to do with wood structure kits is to spray them with a gray primer. Um, I like to use Rust-Oleum Gray Auto Primer. Um, whenever you use this, be sure you're working in a well-ventilated area and wearing proper painting equipment. The primer has a couple advantages. First, it prevents moisture from penetrating the wood from the inside. The primer isn't a wood sealer in the true sense of the word, but it does help minimize the likelihood of humidity damaging the structure and warping it. On the outside, the primer helps ensure an even finish when you spray on the final colors for this structure. And here you can see an example of a kit that I've sprayed with the primer. It has a nice overall even finish on the outside, and on the inside you can see how I've got all the bracing and the wall panels 
covered in primer to make sure that moisture and humidity won't affect the structure kit over the long term. I haven't primed this structure yet, so I'm just going to go ahead and set the roof panels in place temporarily. As you can see, these panels have a little notch and a slot, and those fit into the corresponding tabs. And then once you've primed your, your structure, you can go ahead, you can add the roofing material and the final details until the structure is complete. There are a variety of wood kits on the market today, and by taking the few extra minutes to brace your structure, you'll be able to enjoy them and minimize the risk that they'll warp over time. Nicholson may remind you of a lot of other small towns in northern Pennsylvania. There are the churches and Main Street. But Nicholson has something other towns don't have. It's been called the ninth wonder of the world, the largest concrete bridge. They thought that the uh, taking of the main line out of town was going to destroy the business of the town. Secondly, no people riding in a passenger train that high in the air could catch their breath. And they just thought it was too big an undertaking for the railroad to massive uh, construction like this to, to make it success. Oh, look at this. That, is that from one of your books, Garford? Reverend Garford Williams is a good authority on Nicholson and the bridge. His great-grandfather helped to build the line that preceded the bridge, and he's written a book about the history of the Nicholson Bridge. Nicholson has been a major passenger stop since 1851 when the first steam engine chugged into town. But the ride into town was a steep grade with sharp curves and many crossings. The bridge would cause trains to bypass the town. But before the bridge was complete, there would be a boom in Nicholson. Of course, there had to be a lot of workmen brought into town so that the population increased from about 800 to over 3,500. Every available space in the whole town was made a residence for these workmen. They built shacks along the hillsides. People rented their cellars and their attics and their spare rooms. Everything was full to capacity all over town. Building the world's largest concrete bridge was a dangerous business. Some workers fell to their deaths from the great height. It was rumored that one man was buried in the concrete. It got started by the fact that uh, when the concrete was lifted high in the air, and uh, put on the trolley to go to its destination, a man had to ride the bucket in order to pull the trip rope that opened up the bottom of the bucket to dump the concrete. The man went up, but didn't come back. So they began to speculate that he fell off the bucket and was drowned in the concrete. But they say that later on, he turned up out in California with another man's wife, so that there was no possible way that that man could have been killed. From June of 1912 to November of 1915, Nicholson was buzzing with activity. While the bridge was under construction, there were a number of people who came who wanted to view the work because it was uh, so uh, widely advertised, the building of this bridge. Uh, Henry Ford was here, and Thomas Edison was here, Theodore Roosevelt was here, and many of the past governors of the state of Pennsylvania, and other people who had interest in engineering all came to see the, the work in progress. Crowds gathered to celebrate the opening of the Nicholson Bridge in November of 1915. Well, there were three trains came, one from Buffalo, one from New York, and one from Harrisburg. The one from Harrisburg brought the governor of the state of Pennsylvania. The one from New York brought Mr. Truesdale, who was the president of the railroad. The ones from Buffalo brought people along the line to, uh, who were interested in being here at the dedication. So there were three large, long passenger trains here on the day of dedication. When the celebrations were over, the reality set in. Nicholson was no longer a railroad boomtown. What was left was the ninth wonder of the world, a concrete bridge towering 240 feet above the Tunkhannock Creek. For a while, steam engines brought passengers over the bridge, 
But when Canadian Pacific took over, the regulations and insurance put an end to that. We all want to see trains go across this bridge as we have all our lives. And we have probably maybe 15 to 20 freight trains a day and night going over the bridge at this time. Trains still cross the bridge. Now they carry just freight. And the town of Nicholson may be small, but it's very proud of the largest cement bridge in the world. No trip to Chicago would be complete without a stop at Navy Pier. Originally known as Municipal Pier No. 2, it opened to the public in 1916 and was, at the time, the world's largest pier. Used as a Navy training facility during World War II, by the mid-1970s, the pier had fallen into disrepair. Refurbished in the early 1990s, the pier is once again a year-round shopping and entertainment destination. It becomes a special site at Christmas because at that time, it becomes home to Winter Wonderfest. And no holiday display would be complete without a railroad. But it started small. The very first year of the Winter Wonderfest, a gentleman from downtown Chicago asked Navy Pier if they would be interested in having some trains as part of the Winter Wonderfest. He provided some HO trains, they provided some ceramic buildings, and about four tables, and it was all set up and became a big hit. But the layout didn't stay small. The festival committee quickly realized that a larger display was needed. Enter fate, along with theater and set designer, Clark Dunham. They were able to connect up with Dunham Studios, which is a company from upstate New York that builds primarily Broadway-type theatrical scenery. Uh, who had available a train layout that had originally been built for Citibank in the late 80s for use in the corporate lobby in Manhattan during the holidays. By, that t by the time of the second Winter Wonderfest, it was available. Navy Pier purchased it. It came here and made its first appearance as part of the Winter Wonderfest in 2002. When originally built, the display was designed to represent areas around and in New York State. It was designed to represent Weehawken, New Jersey, as you would look towards Manhattan in 1945, the upper Hudson River Valley in 1955, and then the third site represented the 1939 New York World's Fair. When it was to come to Navy Pier, obviously some things needed to change. Weehawken, New Jersey stayed pretty much the same. The original upper Hudson Valley was reconfigured in minor ways to give you a greater representation of some of the things you might see as you traveled between New York and Chicago via train. The third side, instead of being the New York World's Fair, was completely redone to be a panorama of the downtown Chicago area. A layout this big takes dedicated volunteers a good deal of time to construct. When not in use, the layout lives in two 53-foot semi-trailers. So each year, the setup becomes a challenge. The first year we set this up, uh, it took myself, Will, four carpenters, probably six days to erect the building, drop in the layout sections, and actually have the trains running. Uh, we worked from pictures that we had taken on the first setup that Dunham, uh, when he set it up. When Clark Dunham sold the layout, he offered one piece of advice. Find someone to run it who understands model railroading. Having been in the model railroading hobby for quite some time, uh, Will and I, uh, it's, it's aided us by being able to go in and fix broken scenery, do track work repair, uh, actually go in, we've had to go underneath the layout and rewire sections of it that uh, have been damaged or have just worn out after uh, extensive setup and teardown of the unit. It takes a lot of trains and rolling stock to keep the visitors interested. For the three rail O gauge trains, all of it is provided by MTH Electric Trains as a co-sponsor of the station at Navy Pier. The HO trains are all owned by Navy Pier, having come either with the display when it was originally bought from Dunham Studios, or being purchased uh, since then by our company on behalf of Navy Pier. The controls for all the trains are up in the uh, control tower. 
Uh, it's all run off of relays. Uh, we can run trains in trail through blocks and uh, run as many as four sets of trains on the HO running on the inner and outer loops. With trains running and running for hours on end, maintenance can be daunting. Maintenance sometimes is a nightmare because you consider we're running all these trains 8 to 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, they have to come off and get regular uh, maintenance as far as oiling, cleaning, uh, just, just to keep them all running. The show runs approximately from early December through the first week in January, and the crowds have uh, averaged 450,000 to 500,000 for the first three years. It's enjoyable for Mike and I to come here and observe the people enjoying the trains. Our business had always been doing trade shows or special events for corporations, and to add our hobby of trains to it is a great thing. We really only get one complaint from parents here. Some of them have a hard time getting their children to leave here to go see Santa. When you visit Chicago over the holidays, make sure that you take the time to stop at Navy Pier. Not only will you experience its restored grandeur, but you'll see a little slice of holiday railroad magic at the same time. Many manufacturers offer ready-made, ready-painted figures for your model railroad that you can pretty much just take out of the box and glue on your layout. However, if you have a large model railroad and you need a big population to fill it, painting your own figures is a much more economical solution. I have some figures in front of me here in an assortment of different scales. These are N-scale figures. These are HO scale figures. In order to make the demonstration work a little better today, though, I'm going to work on this G-scale figure, which you can see is only partially assembled. So we'll start by putting him together. One of the first things you want to do is remove any of the sprue material that's still attached to the figure. Uh, we have a piece here on the bottom. I'll use a sprue nipper and just go in and clip that off. Have another piece on the side here that we'll remove. Now you can see that the figure has mold lines. Then we're going to have to take those off because as soon as you paint the figure, you'll notice them uh, very, very pronounced. On small figures like N scale figures, this really isn't much of a problem. But when you're working with a figure that's going to get a lot of uh, detail painting on it, you need to get rid of the mold lines. So in order to do that, I've got a couple of tools that I use. One is a round file. And basically, you use that for getting into folds of clothes and things of that nature. So we'll just take and file off some of his mold and flashing material here. You can also use a sanding stick. Um, you want something that's a fairly fine grit sanding stick, though, because you don't want to rough up the plastic too much, especially on smaller figures, because it'll give you too much grain, uh, and it'll look out of place. Once you have all of the flash and the mold edges removed from the figure, the next thing you want to do in this case, since he has separate arms and separate heads, an assortment of them, I'm going to take and glue pieces on. This figure also came with several different tools uh, that he could hold. I have a hammer here and a pickaxe. I chose the pickaxe, which I've already attached. Since the figure is made of plastic, you can use a liquid plastic cement. In this case, I'm using 10X7R. It's about as simple as holding the arm in place and just running a small bead of plastic cement in there. You want to hold it for a second or two until it grabs. You can also use uh, cyanoacrylate adhesive for this, commonly known as CA, or some people call it ACC. You want to make sure that you get all of the edges so that the arm doesn't come off later if the figure receives a bump or some rough handling. All right, now you can see that this figure has some gaps right here where the body part fits next to the body. And so you're going to want to fill that before you paint it, because once you paint this figure, the gaps will be very, very noticeable. In order to do that, I have some two-part epoxy putty I like to work with. A two-part epoxy putty basically is a, a ribbon of putty, and the two active ingredients for the epoxy are separate. Like you can see here in this little sample, you've got the yellow and the blue. Once you squish them together with your hand, mix it up, it forms a green putty material, 
which you can take and roll into really thin strips and use it to fill in places on the figure. Let me show you one that I've already got going. Here's a figure I worked on yesterday. The next thing you'll want to do is clean off where the putty is built up along the edge, like between his shirt sleeve and his shirt proper. You can do that using a hobby knife and then clean it up using your small files again like you did with the flash. When you have the figure cleaned up, the next step is to take and mount it so that you can actually work on it because you don't want to be holding the figure while you try and paint it. Here's a figure that I've already started work on. I've mounted it to a piece of foam core, which is just a simple board you can buy at any uh, craft store. Uh, mounted him to foam core with a little Elmer's glue. Let that dry for about an hour. And then I sprayed the figure with just plain old Rust-Oleum Auto Primer. Uh, Auto Primer Gray, it produces a nice surface for starting your painting work. And that's what we're going to do next. I like to use acrylic paints when I work on figures. Basically, it doesn't matter whose brand it is as long as they have the color I'm looking for. The acrylics are nice because you can clean them up with water. Brushes are another important piece for painting. You want to use really good brushes because you're dealing with fine, small little parts on figures. I have an assortment of brushes here ranging from a number three brush for doing large areas on big objects, a number two brush for doing a little finer details, and then a zero brush, which is kind of your middle of the road brush for doing large stripes on things, and then uh, finally a, a three aught or a three zero brush for doing really fine details like eyeballs and buttons. All right, so let's get started painting some figures. We're going to start working from inside the figure to outside the figure. So we'll paint places like the face and this man's shirt, which are wrapped around with other things like hats, hair, a jacket, things of that nature. It makes it easier to paint these fine details. The first area we're going to paint is the flesh. I've already primed these figures, and they have their first flesh coat. I like to work in layers. I start with a solid color first that's fairly light, and then I put darker colors over the top in washes. Now, washes are paint that's actually just been diluted with a little water. So these figures already have their tan flesh color on them. I'm going to make a very simple wash, now using a red-brown. And what this will do is bring out the detail around the eyes, the mouth, and places like that. A wash is very simple to make. I just take a little paint, put it onto a work surface. In this case, I'm using an old yogurt container lid. You can see it's been used many times for different flesh or different wash colors. And then you just add a little bit of water to it to dilute the paint. Use a couple of brushfuls here. If you're painting a lot of figures at once, you're going to want to make a fairly large batch so that they all look the same. All right, so with my wash ready, I just take and bring it over the top of the figure. The wash will bring out the details. It looks kind of cartoon-like at the moment because there's a bigger contrast, but as the wash dries, it will actually mute down quite a bit, and so it'll be a lot more subtle, and that's what you're after. Once we've got all the faces done, then we'll do the hands and the arms so that the flesh matches and has the right look. If your figures have finger detail molded in, this is a great way to bring out that as well. Now, if your flesh wash gets a little too dark, you can pick it back up off the figure while it's still wet just by taking a wet brush that has no paint on it and lift it right off. There we go. All right, it's very important to let your wash dry completely before you move on to the next step. That's going to take probably about five to ten minutes. Here's another thing you can do with washes. In addition to bringing out details in facial features, you can use it to bring out details in clothing. On this large scale figure, I've already painted his pants gray and his shirt a tan color. And now I'm going to take and use a darker wash, a dark gray wash actually, to bring out the folds in his clothes. Again, if you have too much paint, as it looks like I do here, just add a little bit more water to take it out. Now this is going to darken your base color as well as fall into the finer points of the clothing. We'll let that wash dry and then we'll come back and do a brown wash on his tan shirt. The next step, once you have all of the clothing finished, is to do the 
smaller details like your buttons, your belt buckles, and belts and other things that they might be carrying. This figure here, I've painted his belt buckle a met metallic silver color. His belt is a nice brown color. And then he has a handkerchief hanging out of the back of his pocket, so I've done one coat of white on that as well. The next step is to take and highlight the raised areas on the figure with a lighter color than the base color that you've used for the figure's initial clothing. So for this figure, we're going to work on his blue pants. We'll take the light blue that I painted the pants, and we're going to make a highlight out of it. So for this, I'm going to need some blue. I'll put it back on my yogurt lid here. And then I'm also going to need a white color in order to just lighten it a little bit. If you used a dark enough wash, sometimes you don't even have to lighten your highlight color at all. You can get away with it just back as the base color that you used for the original clothing. It's too much white paint, so I'm going to wipe off most of it. I'll take and mix it into my blue. It's just going to make a little bit more of a lighter blue out of it. All right, it's ready to use. So at this point, what we want to do is find the areas on the figure that are pretty much raised where light would reflect a little bit off of it in order to make it look like it's higher up. So along this part of his leg is a good spot. Kneecaps are always kind of a highlight. Come down here. And this also is good for getting the tops of folds and clothing. You can see this area around his, uh, the inside of his knee. If we just highlight that lightly. Nice little contrast. You don't want the contrast to be too much because then it gets to look cartoonish. There we go. We've highlighted his pants. I've already done his uh, vest and his shirt. And so this figure is almost done. Basically, the technique I'm here, using here is called working in threes. You're working in a group of colors that are all very similar. Whether you mix them yourself or you actually have colors that are three different shades. For instance, these three browns that I have here. This would be my base color, this would be my shadow color, and this would be my highlight color. Would make a very interesting pair of pants or a vest or a shirt. We just did it by mixing uh, lighter and darker colors, making washes. On smaller figures, such as HO scale, I typically won't paint eyes because it's really noticeable that you've tried to paint eyes on those tiny heads. But on larger figures, such as these G scale figures I've been working on here, eyes are very, very important. There's a nice sort of four-step pattern to painting eyes and then other facial details, too, as you go. And so let me show you how it works. The first step is to paint the whites of the eyes. Now, you don't have to be all that fine, but you want to make sure that you don't wind up painting whites all over the figure. Here I've put the whites within the eye sockets. The next step is to take and paint a vertical line through those whites with your eyeball color. Dark brown, dark blue are usually your best choices. From there, you can take and backfill the whites and the, the pupil area then with more of your flesh colored paint. And so in the middle guy here, I've taken and filled in just underneath the eyes with the flesh paint. This man here, then, I filled in the upper part where the eyelid would be. And for that, I've used a darker tan. I've used something that's a little darker than my original flesh, flesh color, but not as dark as my flesh wash. And then finally, on this last figure, I've put in the facial details, the other details. I've highlighted his nose and his cheeks with a little more uh, lighter flesh paint. And then I've painted his mustache, his sideburns, his hair and away we go. If you're doing female figures, then you'd probably take and want to put a little bit of a rose color into the lips as well. So that's the easy steps for painting eyes. Like I said, HO scale figures, a little too small for eyes, but anything larger than that, eyes are a necessity. To provide a really good illustration of why you want to do washes and highlights, I have two sets of figures here. This set of figures is painted with just straight paint, no highlights, no washes, and the set next to it is painted with highlights and washes to bring out all of the clothing detail. Painting figures can become a hobby all of its own. Remember to start simple with basic washes for clothing and facial details, and then build up your techniques from there. If you paint some figures that you don't like how they turned out, use them in the background or inside buildings and try it again. The important thing is to remember to have fun while you do it. We're going back in time a little bit to 1942 for a visit to the Kanai in western Allegheny of 
C.J. Riley. Hi, C.J. Hi, Alan. Why 1942? Why is that so special? Well, it was the year I was born. Steam power was at its peak. There were a lot of interesting freight cars around and very little diesel power in West Virginia at the time. This is Appalachia in the 1940s when coal is truly king. Coal not only rules the lives of the citizens and politicians, it is the economy. Coal is the engine that drives the small towns back in the hollers. Full employment is not a slogan here, it's a reality because of the war. And the Kanawha and Western Allegheny struggles to keep up with the demand for West Virginia coal by industry and the government. Because of the influence of coal on the railroad, diesels are non-existent. Steam power remains king along with coal. The railroad is freelance, uh, probably best called prototypical freelancing, where I took an actual area of the country, the coal fields of the Gauley Valley, down near the New River Gorge of West Virginia, uh -huh. and projected a line north towards Pittsburgh via Connellsville uh, to get into the steel mill areas of Pittsburgh and Cleveland and the Great Lake Coal Ports. What's the purpose of the railroad? Primarily hauling coal, but also acting as a bridge route between the CNO in the south and the Western Maryland, PNLE, uh, and BNO on the north. Why did you pick the 1940s instead of uh, the diesel transition era? I started off modeling a much earlier era, and I discovered that the variety of freight cars improved uh, after the First World War, as far as I was concerned. Their cars got bigger, equipment got bigger. Uh -huh. And I modeled the Depression, as so many people do for a while, but I, was, I became dissatisfied with that, and upon reading a book uh, on the CNO's branch up uh, to Cass, I realized that during the war, they ran a tremendous amount of traffic up that way to keep it away from the coast. And I got thinking about wartime traffic and troop trains and training camps in the mountains and things. Yeah. And it became a, an ideal time to model heavy traffic in a rural area. And I felt that the operational possibilities would, uh, would greatly increase. What, what is appealing to you about this locale? You like the, the, the coal cars, I'm sure, the hoppers, but... Uh, I did a lot of backpacking in the area when I was younger, and um, I was attracted to the area for that reason. It's very scenic, very rugged. There's a quality of the coal miner's life that I find very intriguing, and a lot of history going all the way back to the Civil War. You believe in a balanced approach to model railroading. What does that, what does that really mean? The phrase that's been used a lot is... Um, uh, a good enough approach, and good enough means a lot of things to different people. Um, I ha think I have a fairly high standard of good enough, and it causes me difficulty, but I, it's a goal that I keep reaching for. I think it's very important to not just model heavily, precisely detailed freight cars or locomotives, the scenes themselves, the structures. Um, I weather everything, including figures. As an architect, what about this hobby really excites you? Structures? The structures are one of my favorite parts. I've built a lot of contest models that have been primarily structures. Um, but at the same time, the history of industrial processes, industrial archaeology as well, is very appealing to me. I cannot build an industry without knowing how the process inside works. Uh -huh. So I spend a lot of time doing research in, in those areas. So you try to locate the windows and doors and the outcroppings on the buildings where they would normally be? If I'm not modeling a building precisely from the prototype, then I try to understand it. It's the industry and the, the process is well enough that I can make modifications to suit the railroad that would be, in fact, logical. It's a very architectural engineering approach, I guess. I frequently work from published plans, but I'm I particularly enjoy finding a prototype, photographing it. I rarely measure it. I don't have the patience to spend the time, but I recreate it using my experience, my sense of proportion, and an understanding of what critical dimensions might be to do a quick sketch. And I usually work directly on my finished material from that sketch. I rarely prepare plans. What would you say are the railroad's best features? I think it gives a very good sense of the region I'm trying to model that uh, someone can come down here, and I've had that happen, where someone came down, looked at a scene, and were sure it was a particular town that they had been to before. And I considered that to be very, a great success. 
What's the most unusual feature on the layout, would you say? Probably the way I've been able to compress the ridges and mountains uh, to get a lot of height without taking up a lot of depth. In the construction business, I was always being around construction sites, hated to see materials thrown away, and I started picking up chunks of foam. They can be cut very easily with a mat knife, set in place, uh, modified until I'm happy with the uh, profile of it, and then by sloping gently in the foreground, increasingly steeply as it blends into the vertical hillside, I can give the appearance of a ridge in the somewhat near distance by covering the vertical face with flattened but three-dimensional trees and get a much closer, much more three-dimensional ridge than a painted backdrop. You've got a number of mirrors here on the layout. and uh, You don't see that too often. How many do you have? At this point, I think I have seven. Most of them are very subtle. In addition to this very small scrap mirror, I've used some bigger ones to do similar work, such as down here where the covered bridge is. As you can see, when the bridge is removed, the scene does not, in fact, flow, flow through the backdrop, but ends at the mirror, which is the disguise carefully with trees and the covered bridge. CJ's line evokes feelings of small town Appalachia. No heavy industry or big cities here, just plain folks. Structures are a special interest of the builder. Most are contest quality buildings that today's architects would never design. Yet for CJ, an architect, they are a welcome break from professional modernism. The Kanawha in western Allegheny feels and looks like a West Virginia coal hauler of the 1940s. There are long strings of hoppers, small towns clinging to the mountain's edge, and lots of steam power. Most of today's are on steam locomotives are highly detailed and look great right out of the box. However, in the real world, a steam locomotive was usually never this clean and usually started to accumulate dirt and other grunge as soon as it left the shop floor. I'll show you some of the techniques I use to weather my steam locomotives, but there are a couple of things you should keep in mind when you begin weathering your steam locomotive fleet. First off, what era do you model? Um, steam locomotives later in the steam era, say during the 1950s, weren't really kept up as nicely as they were back in the heyday of the steam era, say the 20s and 30s, simply because the railroads were waiting to put these locomotives onto the scrap lines. Also, railroads usually kept their passenger locomotives a lot cleaner than their freight or their switch engines, simply because the passenger locomotives were pulling their premier passenger trains Today I'm going to be weathering my New York Central Mikado, which is a hard-working freight engine. So I'm going to want to add some fairly heavy weathering to make this look like a hard-working freight engine. The first thing on a lot of these models is that some of the tender wheels, the trailing truck wheels, and the pilot wheels are unpainted, as well as a lot of the running gear. Basically. There, was, there isn't going to be too much on this freight engine that's going to be shiny by the time I'm done with it. So the first step that I do is I will paint the bright metal wheels with grimy black paint. And I've already done that on the other side. So even if this is the only step you'll take, you can see it already makes quite a difference. Next we'll address some of the different places where a steam locomotive weathers and what causes it. First you'll have some light surface rust. And these will be in areas, say, along some of the piping, perhaps along the smoke box door, anywhere where there's a joint that moisture can get into. Um, the other main place where you'll find some surface rust will be on the tender, say, along the water hatch doors or along the drain plugs where water's accumulated and created surface rust. So to add rust, along with some of the other effects, I'll be using powdered pastels. And these pastels, they come in sticks, and you can simply scrape the color off with your hobby knife. Um, you can mix various browns and oranges to get a good rust color. Mix the color around.
he can dab on some rust. Add a little to the pipes. If you have too much, just blow it off. <coughs> and when working with pastels, you can seal the color simply with a light mist of Tester's Dull Coat. And you'll notice I've gotten some fingerprints here on the model. Um, it's easy to fix. Again, I'll just take a damp paper towel and I'll wipe them right off. Another option to pastel powders is a company called Tamiya makes their, this weathering system. And they have a premixed rust color that's available. Now this medium is more the consistency of, say, a grease pencil. Um, but it's very easy to apply. Wipe it into the rust color. As you can see, this adds a little bit of a different effect. And I'll go ahead and I'll blend that in a little later. The next part of the locomotive that we'll have that shows some different weathering uh, will be scale uh, from condensation from the steam that's coming out of various fittings such as these safety valves or the whistle um, as well as the seam that condenses along the sides of the tender and again for this you can use pastels um, you can mix a very light gray color using white and a little bit of black which I already have some mixed here. And you can apply that up top as if some of the steam has condensed along the side of the locomotive boiler. And again, I like using pastels because you can build up the color slowly. If you just wanted to show a locomotive that had just come out of the shop, just been cleaned, you could just keep it light like that. And again, simply seal it with the dull coat. And you can also get the same effect, again, using the, this Tamiya weathering product. I like to use their light sand color. is actually a light tan, light gray color that looks a lot like the condensation from steam. And again, I'll just wipe the applicator into the product. And you can just smudge it along the sides lightly. And again, if you apply too much or you don't like what you've done, you can just use a damp paper towel and wipe it off. Now another effect to add to a locomotive is that it is that of soot especially if you have a coal burner like this. Um, there are a lot of cinders and things that came out of the smokestack that ended up landing across the top of the locomotive and even over the tender. So for this, you can just use some straight black pastels, add them to the top of the stack. Add a light dusting across the top of the locomotive. And after every coat, just give it a light mist of dull coat. And just repeat that until you get the level of the soot effect that you want. Now the other thing that you can add is some of the dirt that gets kicked up uh, from dirt on the rails, ballast dust, and things like that to the driving wheels of the locomotive, as well as to the tender trucks. Um, you can also e even add, depending on the age of your locomotive, a coat of rust color to simulate light surface rust. Um, but I'll go ahead, I'll add some brown. Again, just brush that across the driving wheels. 
Add some underneath the cylinder. Simulate that dirt that's kicked up. I'll also add some to the tender wheels. As well as to the frame. And I'll just keep build, building up color and different effects using these techniques. As you can see, this model is well on its way to becoming a heavily weathered steamer. I still have some more coats to add, uh, both pastels and some of, the, some of the Tamiya weathering products. Here's a finished model over here. And you can see how I've added the condensation along the sides of the tender, uh, the boiler scale which is, again, from the water condensing coming out of the safety valves and the whistle, um, some dirt along the running gear, as well as some rust on the tender wheels, as well as some light surface rust in places like the air pump on the side of the locomotive, as well as on the smoke box door. These techniques are easy to learn, and it'll take a little bit of time to apply them effectively, but if if you put in the time and the little bit of effort that it takes, you'll have a realistic looking steam locomotive fleet. What is it about trains? Just what is it that makes some people love to watch them go by? It makes others devote their lives and hobbies to inanimate pieces of metal covered with oil and dirt and grime. Could it be that the dirt is from distant places? and that the train represents far more than just a smelly, noisy obstacle to our passage down the highway? Or do they represent a radical departure from the ordinary in our lives, the opportunity to experience all the thrill and excitement of travel? Trains have always spelled romance, danger, travel to distant places. They have spoken of mysteries, dashing men, beautiful women, and the luxury and, well, class of a world known only to the very privileged. The train, or perhaps we should more rightly call it, the railroad has played a major role in the development of civilization. Before there was any interstate road system, long before trucks and automobiles and minivans and electronic fuel injection, there was the railroad. The concept of a nation linked by steel was established in Britain around the early 1700s simply because the British industrialists saw a way to make money through the rapid delivery of goods and services to major metropolitan centers. Business could also use the lines to move hitherto unheard of amounts of material and personnel to distant areas. And they could speed communications between trading ports and mercantile centers. And that all spelled money. But while the railroad also moved goods between developed industrial centers, it also played a major role in the development of the frontier. The railroads often bought huge tracts of land and then built a rail line through it. The land was then sold to homesteaders who were clustered around the rail line and dependent upon it for shipment of cattle and produce to market. And conversely, for the delivery of manufactured goods to make their lives less harsh. The railroad was a workhorse used in mining and timber to make a path into areas that were previously inaccessible. Mountains were crossed, gorges were spanned, hardships were overcome so that paths of steel could snake to the horizon. And as the nation was covered by a spider web of silver rail, the railroads became our lifeline, carrying the mail, cattle, baggage, soldiers, war material, fruit, coal, steel ore, raw material and finished goods from market to consumer to producer and back. Danger, travel, excitement. That's what the railroads came to mean. The engineer was a kind of a god, master of the monster that opened up new horizons. The man whose eyes actually saw the towns over the distant hill and who lived with the danger of weather and moving machinery. Who hasn't heard the whistle of a late night train and wished that they weren't up there with the engineer going somewhere? More than anything, the railroads came to identify with travel, new places, 
and all the romance and excitement that accompanies it. The railroads have been a part of some of our liveliest folklore, our music, and our heritage. So why? Why trains? Why did children of 70 years ago, just as children of today, want to wake up on Christmas morning to a sparkling train under the Christmas tree? The psychologists would analyze it as a good fantasy instrument, a device whereby the child could exert control, starting and stopping and throwing switches to make different paths, and making imaginary people and loads get on and off, just like the real thing. But it was more than that. It was mastery of power and an imaginary opportunity to travel. And children, like myself, begged to be taken to the station on a nightly basis just to see the trains. What is this love affair? The man who can explain love may discover the answer, but until then, I guess those of us involved in this matter will have to content ourselves with watching the trains go by or modeling the real railroads and pretending, or putting our eye down to the track and wishing that we were in charge of that thundering demon moving into the horizon to some distant escape of our common lives to danger, travel, intrigue, and romance. We've reached the end of the line for this edition. We hope you've enjoyed the ride. We'll have more layouts, prototypes, and how-to tips next time, and more fun with the world's greatest hobby in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. Welcome to the Dream, Plan, Build video series. In this collection, you'll see amazing layouts of fellow modelers, some of the most interesting trains and railroads around, and plenty of tips and techniques to make your time at the workbench and at the throttle more productive and a lot more fun. We'll travel across America in search of layouts we all dream of operating and get inside the heads of their builders as they describe how they designed and built their prized railroads. Plus, whether you're running a 4x8 or a 40x80 operation, You'll discover tips and techniques to make your rolling stock run smoother and look more realistic.